And so a few announcements tonight as we uh, get started. Of course, uh, one more week of class and then we're off for two weeks uh, for the Christmas break. And then we are in lesson 11 tonight, but we are going to touch on something we kind of uh, skipped over in lesson 10, so the very end of lesson 10. So we'll be in Genesis 49 uh, just for a few minutes this evening. Uh, but you will need pages 60 to 64, I guess, if we need the class notes from from lesson 10 is 60 if you want to get page 60 out and then we'll be doing 61 and 63 for lesson 11 this evening and also if you want to get out ahead of time now you can always write on your class notes to come back to it later but we will be mentioning the uh, topic sheet what early man knew um, before Moses had it written and then your characteristics of God and the names of God and again, if you want to, for the sake of time, you can just write in your uh, class notes uh, that you need to write the information in there. But um, those are some things we're going to touch on uh, this evening. So, and uh, a couple, couple other announcements I want to um, make tonight is, um, first of all, Merry Christmas. This, we're finally into Christmas, a little more festive here tonight. And I left you a card, if you will, on the table. That is your Christmas card. It talks about... Our Kinsman Redeemer. Now, last week we just touched on Kinsman Redeemer, if you remember that. And we will learn much, much more about the Kinsman Redeemer next year as we study Ruth, uh, Lord willing. But I just couldn't resist bringing it out tonight. So you can take that home and read through it. But again, we've seen appearances of the angel of the Lord all throughout history so far, right? And a lot of people say, we all say, you know, Christ's first coming is when he came in a manger. But that's not entirely accurate, is it? He came all throughout history. What we celebrate as Christmas is his first coming as a man, as a human being born of a woman. But all throughout history we see him, and he came so that he could redeem us, so that he could buy back what was lost, which was the responsibility of a kinsman redeemer. And as we study the book of Ruth, we'll realize that the kinsman redeemer, we touched on it, we'll learn in the book of Ruth that the kinsman redeemer had to be willing to redeem what was lost, right? He had to be willing, and we even talked about last week how if they weren't willing, they could be taken to court, right? It was a responsibility, but there was reasons they might not be willing. They had to be able to, right? They had to be able to meet the needs of uh, the one in need, and, uh, and then they had to be related, okay? The kinsman redeemer. And so with Christ, as you read this, just keep this in mind. I just wanted to define it a little bit because we haven't gotten much into it. But Christ was willing to redeem us, wasn't he? He's the only one who is able to redeem us. But he wasn't related. He had to become man so that he could redeem us. All right? And so what an incredible thing he has uh, done for us. So this is your uh, Christmas card from me. So you enjoy that. Also, just another thing, a couple things I want to point out. You know, as we study God's Word like this, a lot of times when we study God's Word, we think of it as is the Bible, which it is. It's something we look at on Sunday or go hear a sermon on. It's our religious book, if you will, right? But it's really not a religious book. God's Word, it's, it's not just religious. It's not a me book. It's not about what I can glean from it, although we can't. This is actual history, right? And we've pointed this out all through, and I'm hoping you're grasping that as we tie things in. It's a history book. And it's on the map, right? As we've looked at the map, these locations really exist. And it's on the timeline of history. And there's other things going on in the world. I mean, we all know this, right? But to actually realize this lines up with history, and as we've gone along, we've shown some archaeology and some things that they have found uh, that proves it. But I just want to get that into our head, that there are other um, events and kingdoms going on. And I have the timeline over there. And um, I really encourage you to look through the timeline. And this week, I actually brought a magnifying glass so you can actually see the timeline over there. Just lift that up. But these are actually events in history. And these things happen, but there's other things going on in the world. So again, you can't see it very clearly here, but this is when Joseph uh, is sold into Egypt. Okay, and then later we're going to find Moses comes on the scene tonight, okay? All this time later. But there's other things going on down in Babylon. 
uh, in a little while here, what, after, while Joseph's in Egypt, while the Israelites are in Egypt, uh, Hammurabi comes on the scene in Babylon. Have any of you heard of Hammurabi? Okay, we're going to be talking about him in a couple weeks. He comes on after Joseph has been uh, in, uh, in Egypt, before Moses comes on the scene. And so that comes out important later. Italy is about to come into its power. Uh, the Shang dynasty in China. Because I forget the fourth or fifth dynasty of China. And you can check on the back table where there. But all of this stuff is going on in the world. And at this time, and then when we see Moses, we see Asia uh, Minor start coming into power. And so just the things that are happening. And of course, this all comes from way back. And these, this is all I copied from um, the, the handout there, or the timeline, from the Tower of Babel, right? All these nations that came out of the Tower of Babel. And then as they start developing and becoming kingdoms, all this stuff is going on in the world. And there's the time of uh, Abram there I have on the chart. But just keep that in mind that other things are happening. Um, interesting enough, the Egyptian timeline is the hardest to decipher because when the Egyptians wrote their records, they lied. They exaggerated. Their kings lived for hundreds and thousands of, you know, they exaggerated and there's a lot of overlap. So we sometimes have the hardest time finding out which pharaoh exactly was in power at what time. There's a lot of, there's co-regents involved in different things as well. So that's kind of the hardest to find out. But also we've seen from archaeology um, that things line up with scripture and when they find these things and discover them, it's so fascinating as we've already covered many times because it lines up, big surprise, exactly with what we see in scripture. But for every one of these we find, you know, there'll be thousands of skeptics who say, well, that's not what it is, you know, and they'll try to uh, disclaim it. But the proof is there. One of them, a uh, friend just sent me this week. I don't know if you can see that. But it's called the Famine Stella. Is an inscription written in Egyptian hieroglyphics located on the Sephel Island in the Nile near Aswan in Egypt, which tells of a seven year period of drought and famine during the reign of Pharaoh. What a cute, what a cool find, right? Now I'm sure the skeptics will pin it on some other date somehow or something. But God just keeps revealing more and more that lines up with history and the proof is there. So again, as we study this, get excited about the fact that this is not just some rambling uh, religious book trying to teach us some lessons for life or something, right? This is actual history on the map. It's proven throughout time and history and archaeology, and so um, it's completely accurate. And God shows us through it the timeline of man from the beginning and who he is with man, his relationship, right, and what he's done uh, and shows the actual history of his plan of redemption for all who would believe, for the whole world. Okay, so I just want to, us to take a, just give it the credit it's due as we study his word. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. And feel free to look at the chart over there. It's just really fascinating to see all that was going on at this time. All right, well, last week uh, we covered Lesson 10 pretty quickly, and um, we sped up as we got to the end. Uh, and so 49, chapter 49, we covered really quickly. And I just wanted to touch on one point um, as we uh, open tonight. Um, well, actually, I guess we should open in prayer, shouldn't we? I skipped that part. I think that's all the announcements. Is that everything? So, all right, Susie, can you open us? Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you for another day. Thank you for your word, and, and Lord, thank you that in your word you chose to reveal some of the different things that you've been doing throughout history, the way that you were so actively involved in Joseph's life and the life of all the Israelites, and now we're going to see how you are so actively involved in Moses' life and the things that were going on, and Lord, because of that, we can know that you're actively involved in our life. Lord, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Lord, help us not take your word lightly, but to take it seriously and, and to treasure it. Lord, help us to set aside all of our busyness of the day and the week so that we can be in your word and spend time with you. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And most of all, thank you for the gift of salvation and for being our kinsman redeemer. Mm -hmm. Lord, I thank you and I praise you. 
And I ask you also that you would give Brenda Bolinos as she teaches tonight and that um, you would grasp and understand the different things that we learn. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Well, as I said, our last lesson, um, we saw the prophecies in chapter Genesis 49. And again, you should have a lot of yellow in there because as, um, as a father is dying, he would bestow his blessings on his sons. But this was also prophetic because God is telling him what to say and God is looking in the future and telling him what is actually going to happen. And we went over these uh, for the most part last week. But I want to touch on Judah one more time. If someone would read... Uh, Genesis 49, verse 10. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Okay. So I think someone la asked last week, and I, uh, I misunderstood, but you can, count, uh, you can color the pronouns there in orange, because who is this speaking of? This is speaking of Jesus between his feet, that would be circled in in orange, until he comes um, to whom it belongs shall come. And then in your margin, be sure to write a cross. But we'll see also that this is a double prophecy. It is also, has Jesus, uh, are the nations obedient to him yet? No, so it refers to his first coming and his second coming. So you can draw a cross and a crown in the margin there. And um, we saw, again, that the prophecy would come through the line of Judah last week. We talked about that on your topic sheet. Um, clues to the Savior is that he would come through the descendant of Judah. That was prophecy. And the scepter, um, in the King James, it reads, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come and unto him shall be the gathering of the people so in the King James it's the word Shiloh in the NIV it's he to whom it belongs it's the same word okay he to whom it belongs is the word Shiloh so I have that up on the board there Shiloh to whom it belongs have you heard of Shiloh before referring to Christ it comes from this verse okay so you might want to write that in your margin to whom it belongs is the word Shiloh Okay, and so underline in your uh, verse there to whom it belongs and then write in the margin Shiloh or the other way around if you have it in the King James. Okay, so the uh, Messiah was referred to as Shiloh by the Jews because of this verse, okay? This is who they were looking for. And the prophecy says that there would be a ruler in Israel until the Messiah came. So from the start of when there's a ruler in Israel, not yet, again, this is prophetic, but from the time there is a ruler in Israel from the tribe of Judah until Shiloh comes, all right, the scepter would not part from him. There would be lawgivers or leaders until the Messiah came. And an interesting note I wanted to touch on from Daisy, uh, David Guzik from the Enduring Word. He writes something very interesting about this. But he says the promise was that Israel would keep his scepter until Shiloh comes. Even under the foreign masters during this period, Israel had a limited right to self-rule until 7 AD. All right? So even under the foreign masters, um, uh, they did. I think he covers this in a minute. Then under Herod and the Romans, the right of capital punishment was taken away. At that time, the rabbis considered it a disaster of unfulfilled scripture. Seemingly, the last visage of scepter of the scepter had passed from Judah, and they had not seen the Messiah. All right. So rabbis would walk the streets of Jerusalem, and they said, "Woe to us, for the scepter has been taken away from Judah, and Shiloh has not come." That's around 7 A.D. that they did this. Yet God's word had not been broken, because certainly Jesus was alive at that time. All right. So perhaps this was the year, the, the commentary says, perhaps this was the very year that Jesus was 12 years old and discussed God's word in the temple with the scholars of his day. Perhaps he impressed upon them with his understanding of this very issue. Now in 7 AD, Jesus would have been anywhere from 
7 to 10 or 11 years old because he was born possibly in 3 or 4 BC. The timeline is off site slightly. Um, so when the Jews were mourning about the loss of their right to rule, Jesus may have explained that the prophecy simply meant that the Messiah was alive at that time. Isn't that interesting? Can you see Jesus at that time explaining? So you might want to make a note uh, in your margin on this that I have it on the board that around that verse 10, around 640 years to fulfill it in part through David when David became king. David is, is a descendant of Judah and the first king of Israel that's through Judah. And so from the time of David and then um, around 1600 years to fulfill in Jesus. All right, so Jesus was born before Israel lost its law-making rights. So the prophecy only fulfilled in Jesus and could not have been filled by, fulfilled by any other, right? If Jesus is not the Messiah, then indeed this prophecy never came true, right? So some skeptics say it wasn't fulfilled, so the Bible's not, not true, right? But Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, and some say that it's not Jesus. Jesus is not the Messiah, but he's the only one who can fulfill this prophecy. Okay, so um, they lost their law-giving ability after he was born. So the prophecy is fulfilled. So both types of thoughts can be answered through this prophecy, if you know the answers well. So isn't that interesting? All right, so God fulfills the prophecy in Jesus. And then let's just touch on a couple other things as we uh, skipped over them last week. Let's look at Genesis 50. Was there any thoughts or questions on that? Did you all catch the significance of that? All right, let's look at Genesis 50, 24 through 26. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath, or swear an oath, and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. Okay, so you see Joseph's understanding of God's promises and made them swear an oath that they would carry his bones up. He knew that at some point they're going to go back to Canaan, all right? And if he knew the prophecies from Genesis, he knew it'd be 400 years, right? So he's put in a tomb there in Egypt for over 300 years and then taken back. Uh, they swore this, this oath here. And so um, let's uh, turn to Hebrews 11:22 tonight. I have your verses on your table there. And put a bookmark in there because we're coming back there a couple more times tonight. Hebrews 11.22, it's page 1881. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. Okay, so again, his faith is mentioned in Hebrews 11, that he had trust in what God had said. And we're not going to look it up, but in Exodus 13, 19, we see that Moses took Joseph's bones with them. That's about 400 years later. And then in Joshua 24, 32, we see that 40 years later, Joshua, uh, they're still carrying Joseph's bones around for 40 years while they wander. You're kidding me. And then they've been, uh, while they were wandering in the desert, okay, we'll cover that. Um, but they do take his bones uh, back into the promised land. Okay, so the faith that they had in God's promises right? And so this finishes our account of Genesis. We have now completed the first book of the Bible. Anybody have any questions on any of that? Was that an interesting study? Mm -hmm. We learned a lot. And you have um, your cross-references for what we just covered was on your class notes, uh, the end of Lesson 10 there. And the box 16 of Lesson 10 on page 60 goes over the review of Genesis. So I'll let you go ahead and read that at home. But we're going to jump in tonight uh, into Lesson 11. So you'll need page 61 next to 63. 61 to 6 and 63. 
And as we turn to Exodus, at the very top margin, you can write a continuation of Genesis. Exodus is a continuation of Genesis. Now, again, a lot of times when we come to God's Word, you just jump into a brand new book and don't realize the events that have taken place. But this is just a continuation of the same account, right? And so write that in your top margin. And um, in your class notes also, something else to write in your margin. Uh, we saw in box one there, of page 63, um, that Genesis meant uh, beginnings, origins, the first in place in time. I hope you've put that in Genesis. And Exodus, we see, means to exit, to depart. It means going out. So write the meanings of these names in each of the books as we cover them. All right, and then let's go ahead and read Exodus 1, 1 through 5. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Okay, so in your home study, page 61, where was Israel, where was Jacob and his sons living at this time? In Egypt. Why were they in Egypt? Because of the famine, right? All right, and what had God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants? And I gave you several references there if you did them and you looked them all up. They all tell us basically the three things. What had God promised them in his covenant? The land, descendants, blessing to all nations, blessing through their offspring, which points towards Christ. And so did God know, your next question, did God know they would be living in Egypt? Of course. Let's look up Genesis 15 and read 12 through 16. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful cloud came over him. Then the Lord, 16, then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own not their, uh, not their own, and that it, <laughs> they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried in a good old age, and the fourth generation your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. God told them a whole lot. He told them a whole lot in that, right? 400 years, four generations the sins of the Amorite until the sins of the Amorite require God stepping in and judging them. And so this was no surprise to God. It was also no surprise to his followers. I think Joseph knew all of this, right? And so when his family comes down or when the famine happens, he's in Egypt and his family comes down, I think Joseph said, oh yeah, God said Egypt, or country not their own, 400 years. Okay, I don't think this was a surprise because he trusted God. He knew God. And so the, the book of Exodus fulfills this uh, prophecy here that we saw in Genesis, and you can uh, a reference back to that is in box two. And then let's go to Exodus 1 and read 6 through 10. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all the generations died, but the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous, so that all the land was filled with them. Then a new king, who did not know about Joseph, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Okay, so in your home study there, um, it tells us uh, that God had blessed Jacob and the twelve sons, and now their descendants increased greatly and became so numerous that the land was filled of them. Why did this trouble the king of Egypt? He's afraid that they would become joined with the enemies. Now, the new king of Egypt, it says it did not know about Joseph or how he had saved all of Egypt. And this expression, did not know, can mean truly that he did not know about him. Uh, or it can also mean that he didn't concern himself about it. He didn't care about that. He had a greater concern. He can, was concerned they would turn on them. So it could be either way. Um, but he feared the Israelites because there were so many of them. And who was this Pharaoh? We don't really know. There's a lot of 
a lot of research uh, done on that, uh, many studies. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint exactly uh, which pharaoh, but um, some believe that it was a foreigner who uh, made conquest over Egypt, the haikus, if you dated at that time, and then he literally would not have known about Joseph, but I'm not sure if the time frame works on that. But it's possible that he just didn't care, and um, he feared they would join the enemies. From the northern kingdoms up here would come down to fight Egypt, and who do they have to pass through before they get to Egypt? Canaan and then Goshen, so if the Israelites want to join them, right, so they're kind of a buffer there before, but also Egypt would go a lot and fight up in Canaan. We're going to talk about that later, but a lot of the battles and wars would happen up here in Canaan. But if the Israelites join their enemies, right, there's con con concern there. And so uh, he had reason for concern, um, but what did he do to the Israelites? Let's read 11 through 14. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. They built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar and brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Okay, they made their lives bitter. That word comes up later. You can circle it if you want to. Um, it becomes part of one of their feasts to recognize the bitterness of their lives in Egypt. So the first thing I've written, uh, number one in the margin next to verse 11, they put slave masters over them. They did several things trying to oppress them here and keep their numbers from growing. They put slave masters over them, and uh, yet they continued to grow, right? That did not work. Yes, Crystal. So before this, they weren't slaves? No, when Joseph was in power, they weren't, they weren't slaves. slaves. Right. No, when Joseph was a slave, and then he was put into second in command in all right. of Egypt, so he's no longer a slave. Right. And then when his family came down, they were free to live in the land. Yeah. No. So all of a sudden, in verse 11, now they're slaves. It's like, but like why did the people let that happen to them? And all of a sudden, when, it was, when the famine came, mm -hmm. that's partly the reason that they sort of became slaves, because they had to give everything that they had. All of Egypt <laughs> did. Yeah, right. all of Egypt, not the and Israelites. Well, the Israelites came in with mm -hmm. Jacob slash yeah. Israel. But I think that they're being part of Joseph's family. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on this, Susie? Being part of Joseph's family, he's royalty, if you will, that they were protected. And they're outside of Egypt, out in the pasture lands. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that it really applied to them. Okay? They that were, would be my guess. They were shepherds, but they were also taking care of some of Pharaoh's flocks also. Oh, that's right. So they were employee, or an employee of Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they were seen as slaves until here. That's yeah. my thinking, but I don't have to. And if I remember correctly, Joseph's the one who suggested that mm -hmm. to Pharaoh, and I don't think he included his family uh, in that and as well. Yes. I mean, we say, you know, I mean, that it happened on the verse 11, but it probably happened over a period of time. Yeah. To like all the things that we, even in our country, how did we allow it to get to this? Well, mm -hmm. it's one step at a time, and we give away freedoms, and we give away mm -hmm. until we go. How did we get here? Mm -hmm. I mean, I you know, I think if we look around at our own country, we can kind of see how things yeah. happen. That we, if you know, 50 years ago, if you had said where we'd be now, people would be like, no, yeah, no, that'll never happen. Yeah, well said. Yeah, <clears throat> yes. Uh, was there another question? I thought I saw another hand. Yeah, so so absolutely, and this was after Joseph and everyone from that generation had died, and so the next generation's coming up as shepherds, and I think also because they're shepherds, you know, they have their staff to fight with, you know, but I think the powers of Egypt could also overwhelm them, whether little, little by little makes sense, um, harder and harder, more and more demands, perhaps. Um, but yeah, time goes by, and so again, we're just getting into the next part of the prophecy uh, that God had said they'd go down to Egypt, and then now, later, they're becoming slaves. So what Pharaoh had done uh, is he, he made them into slaves, um, and they're mistreated, yet they continue to grow, and so what does he do? Number two is in verse 13, he worked them ruthlessly. 
right? He made their lives bitter. Okay, and he had them build uh, the cities there. And so what did Pharaoh try to stop them from increasing in numbers in 15 and 16? Let's read that as well. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra, Zifra, and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. 17 no, that's good, through 16. Oh. Just to pick up on that, my mind wandered, Crystal, back to what you had said, and, and Susie had said that they were shepherds, and they took care of the sheep. I have a couple different verses. Okay. Okay, so it starts out here. Um, Pharaoh was asking what was her occupation. Her servants are shepherds. They replied to Pharaoh, just as our fathers were. And so we've come to live here for a while, and then it goes on to say further down, um, Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen, and if you know of any among them with special ability, put them in charge of my own livestock. Okay. And then you come over a little bit further, and it says, now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen, they acquired property there, and they were fruitful and increased greatly in number. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Chapter 47. 47. Okay. And so they, uh, they did prosper, but when they made them into slaves, look what they had them do in verse 11, is they forced them into labor, not into shepherding anymore. And so they had them build cities. And so, again, they took them out of Goshen, not all of them, of course, but they took them off and, and forced uh, the labor. So they weren't just slaves being shepherds. They were forced to build uh, cities there. And the cities there mentioned, um, Pitom and Ramses. Ramses, that's why some people date it back to uh, the Pharaoh being Ramses, but that's not necessarily the time frame uh, at all, but that's one of the reasons they give. But they put them into forced labor, uh, different from what was before, okay? And so we just read about the midwives. And so the third thing that Pharaoh tried to do is he tried to kill all the babies. And I've numbered them in my margin here. Next to 11, it's his first attempt. Next to 13, it's his second attempt. When that didn't work in verse um, 16, it's the third attempt, kill the baby boys. Right? He told the midwives to kill the Israelite baby boys as they were born. And Exodus 1.17 tells us why it failed. If someone wants to read verse 17. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Okay, you can highlight that in green, right? They feared God. They, however, feared God, did not do what the king told them. Okay? So, what would be the penalty for defying the Pharaoh? Probably death. Yeah. Yeah, death. But the midwives feared the Lord rather than the one who could kill them. Right? Isn't that the right focus? All right. And what is their response? Let's read 18 and 19. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwife. <coughs> okay, I do like that. Um, all right, so the question always is, did the midwives lie to Pharaoh? And nothing in the text tells us they lied. That's something we jumped to that conclusion. All right, in your class notes, I have a quote from the John MacArthur commentary, and he says, rather than trying, this is box three, Rather than trying to argue for a justifiable lie on the part of the midwife seeking to protect God's people, it's better to take it as a statement of what was actually true. God was directly involved in his affair of birth and national growth. This is the key of to understanding why no decree of Pharaoh would work out as he intended it and why Hebrew women were so healthy and gave birth with ease, right? God's hand was in all of this, causing them to multiply. So the midwives, um, they could have shown the families what to do, right? They could have purposely arrived late. 
Uh, there's any number of things uh, that they, they could have done to find a way around Pharaoh's orders. All right, and what is God's response to this? Let's read 20 and 21. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Isn't that cool? So if you're highlighting, again, God and his pronouns in orange and then in purple was kind to the midwives, gave them families of their own, right? This is how God blessed them for having the proper fear of the Lord, the proper understanding of who he is. He blessed them because they feared the Lord rather than the fear of man. Okay, and then in verse 22, we see Pharaoh's fourth attempt uh, to hurt the Israelites here. Verse 22. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. Okay, so you can write a number four in the margin there, and this is where uh, we find out about Moses. So this is the events of Moses' life. All the baby boys, you know, there's probably no other boys, Israelite boys, Moses' age, right? You think about this, this is a real thing. We read about the rescue of Moses here, but the other baby boys were thrown into the Nile. So horrible? it's horrible, it's yeah, horrible. because of his fear. Yeah, yeah. Can Sarah. you tell the verses for the 1, 2, 3, and 4 one more time? Yes. Uh, number 1 would be verse 11, put slave masters over them. Number 2 is verse 13, worked them ruthlessly. And number 3 is what he told the midwives in verse 16, if the baby is a boy, kill him. And then number 4 is verse 22, throw the boys in the Nile. So let's go ahead and meet Moses here, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Okay, and here it tells us that a man of the tribe of Levi, so this is a Levite, uh, but it doesn't tell us who they are. Let's turn to Exodus 6, 20, and we will find out who they are. Exodus 6, 20. Amram married his father's sister, Jacobed, who bore him Aaron and Moses. Amram lived 137 years. Okay, so isn't that interesting? We have their names there. So you can write Exodus 6.20 in red in your margin there, and you have Moses' parents' names that you can uh, write in your margin there. I wrote their names in green uh, just because it's uh, trivial information. Any, any way you want to do that. And so they put his parents here, put him in a basket in the Nile. And... Box five in your class notes, um, your cross-reference there, by the way, is box four for the parents' names. And then in box five, basket, it's the Hebrew word meaning ark, which means a floating box or vessel. Remember when we were studying the ark, the only two places this is used in scripture is for the ark of Noah's day and the uh, ark, the basket that Moses was put in. So it's a saving ark. It's just meant to float. Okay, and this is the same word, uh, that's what it says in your class notes, 614, for the ark God told Noah to build. Noah's ark was a floating vessel. It didn't have to go anywhere, it just had to float. The word is only used these two times in Scripture. And when we see the ark of the covenant, that's a totally different word. Okay, so in English where you see ark, it might not be the, be the same Hebrew word. All right. And so she put him in a floating basket to save his life. And in box 6, the basket in Exodus 2-3 was most likely a burial basket. In Egypt, when someone died, the body would often be sent down the Nile in a basket covered in pitch so that it would float. Now, this is one of the things they would do, not the only thing they would do, but this is one of the ways uh, that they would deal with their dead. The Egyptian worshipped uh, what they considered the god of the Nile River, known as Happy. 
Happy was considered by the Egyptians to be the giver of life and the source of eternal life. So you send the body down the Nile to their eternal life. Okay? And so this could have very well have been uh, that. And again, no one would dare disturb a basket floating on the Nile if this was a custom, right? Unless, of course, they heard a baby cry from inside it, right? And so box uh, seven here in your class notes, you can cross-reference with Hebrews 11. So let's turn back to Hebrews 11. And again, keep a bookmark there. I think we'll go and visit that again another time tonight. Hebrews 11, 23, page 1881. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edit. Okay, you can highlight that in green. They were not afraid, just like the midwives. They feared God rather than man, right? All right. And they could see there was something different about Moses. God had a plan here. And then we'll jump back to Exodus 2 when you're ready and read verses 5 through 10. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. <coughs> And his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. But when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. All right. An interesting account here. So in your home study, how did God protect baby Moses from Pharaoh? Isn't it interesting that God used Pharaoh's daughter to protect Moses from Pharaoh? Right? And used Moses' mother to get paid to nurse him? All right. And so again, uh, in those days, they would nurse perhaps even up to five years because again, they didn't have the refrigeration. So anywhere from three to five years, they would nurse. So she got this time with him. And so a lot of people have said, well, Moses couldn't have remembered his mother, you know, because when he's weaned, he goes to Pharaoh's daughter, but, but he, wasn't, he wasn't one, you know, like we do today or one or two. He was probably three to five years old and he remembered uh, what she had taught him. Okay. So next, box eight, Moses sounds like the Egyptian and Hebrew word for draw out. Moses was drawn out of the water, and he would be used by God to draw Israel out of Egypt. Moses was delivered, and he would be used by God to deliver Israel. All right. In your home study, this event is the actual historical account of what happened. However, God also uses this event to point us to the Messiah. Have we seen that in Scripture? How he uses the foreshadowing or the pictures to point to the Messiah. In your chart there at the bottom of page 61, the Israelites had been slaves in <coughs> Egypt. And the picture for us is John 8.34. We are all slaves to sin, John tells us, if you looked that up this week. Okay. And at the time of Moses' birth, the king ordered all Israelite baby boys to be killed. What a horrendous event. Who would do that, right? Well, we see it done again in Matthew, in the time of Jesus. Because Herod was so afraid of the Messiah coming, as the wise men said, what does he do? He orders the baby boys to be killed ages two and under. Okay, and next on your chart, Moses, however, was saved from death. And in Matthew chapter 2, we see Jesus was saved from death as an infant, interestingly enough, by fleeing to Egypt. His parents took him to Egypt and fled until uh, he had died, the ruler had died. And then God used Moses to save the Israelites from their bondage, and we see what does John 3.16 tell us, that God so loved us that he did not want any of us to perish. In Romans 10, 9, Christ offers salvation from our bondage to sin and the penalty for sin. So see the correlations here? The picture that um, 
God is drawing here the types, and as you continue through God's word and mark them in some way, um, like a cross or something, and you might want to actually put a chart, write a chart like this into your margin of your Bible. I have done that in my Bible here, uh, so that you see the correlation there. And then in box nine here as we go, um, why did God allow them to be slaves in Egypt for 400 years? And the answer is it was for their safety. And we have some reasons listed there, five reasons listed there. The Israelites began, being in Egypt kept them from intermarrying with the Canaanites. Canaanites. Remember, Judah had married a Canaanite, and his sons were so wicked, and just the influence of the Canaanites. Again, God is going to have Israel destroy the Canaanites because of how wicked they are. What if they all intermarried with them, mm -hmm. right? So he pulled them out of Egypt, or out of Canaan, moved them to Egypt uh, to be kept from the Canaanites, who God would later judge. And then while the Israelites were in Egypt, as we said earlier, looking at the map, Canaan was a frequent battleground. If Hebrews had been in Canaan, they could have been destroyed by warring communities, or they would have had to make alliances with the Canaanites and fight with them, right, to protect their territory there. And so the northern kingdoms, as we said, in Egypt would, would fight to dominate the city-states that were in Canaan. So a lot of battles going on. So God had them tucked safely away in Goshen as shepherds. The third point is, as slaves, they did not intermarry with the Egyptians. Now, if they had just left there and never became slaves, well, now I guess the Egyptians wouldn't have married them anyway because of their occupation. So, um, uh, and they also, uh, number four, they were also moved to cry out to God, looking for deliverance. If their life was lovely and perfect in Egypt, would they have cried out to God? to rescue them, right? He got their hearts ready to cry out to him. See, all of this bad stuff that happens to them, what was God doing? He's using it for their good. He's using it for a pl the plan that he has to bring them back. Isn't that interesting to look at history from God's view and maybe apply that to our life as well? In, uh, fifthly, there they became numerous enough to be able to form the army needed to take the promised land. Okay, again, see God's hand in all of this? All right, and yet people will say, if God is a God of love, why did he let them be slaves in Egypt and why? Okay, that's very narrow focused, isn't it? God had a plan through all that. Through the struggling, through the strife, through the bondage, he had a plan and he works it out for good. We should remember that when it comes to the troubles that come into our lives. Absolutely. God working in our life. Absolutely. We should... Always look to him for that, that the trouble I think we covered last week or a week before, that they are for our own good, right? Mm -hmm. And for the future plans that he has. Um, so yeah, very good. Very applicable. Mm -hmm. All right, let's read to Exodus 2, 11 through 15. <clears throat> One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Okay, several things in that. Did you hear what <coughs> Moses says, verse 11? Or he doesn't say this, but what it says about Moses, where his own people. And at the end of the verse, his own people. Did Moses know who he was? Yes. Yeah. He's, he's raised uh, as a prince of Egypt. Now, um, Josephus, we've quoted Josephus' works before. I, I meant to look it up. I totally forgot about that. But Josephus tells us, and again, he's a, he's a very um, historian who's a very stickler for accurate history. But it's not scriptural. So we don't, it can't, it, it could have errors. But he tells us that Moses was a general in the Egyptian army and led several campaigns. So Moses is um, quite up there in the military, and it even tells us, Josephus tells us what uh, groups of people he defeated. 
So uh, according to history, anyway, he was a general in the army as well, okay? But here he comes to his people and um, he's been raised by Pharaoh's daughter, probably a general in the Egyptian army, and yet he knows uh, his people, he cares what happens to them. So let's look up Acts 7, and this is in box 10 there, Acts 7, and read, I have 23 through 29 there, but let's, let's go ahead and read 23 through 30. It's page 1715, and then bookmark that as well, because we'll be coming back to it. Acts 723. When Mo Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his fellow Israelites. He saw one of them mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard, Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. And verse 30 as well. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. Okay, and then put a bookmark there. We'll be coming back. But did you see, before you turn from there, in verse 25, Moses thought his own people, right? Again, it says the same thing, that he had thought they would. Um, but again, they see him as the Egyptian here. And so... Um, here we learn that this happened when Moses was 40 years old. So back in chapter 2 of Exodus, you can write in the margin there during this account, uh, it says in verse 11, one day after Moses had grown up, so he's 40 years old, right? He's not a lad anymore, okay? He's 40. Okay. And interesting, they say, who made you ruler and judge? Forty years later, God will make Moses ruler and judge over them. All right. And your uh, cross-references there are in box 10. And let's also look up Hebrews, back to Hebrews 11. Cross-references there in box 10. Hebrews 11, and this time 24 through 27. By faith, Moses, who had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, who chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. All right, now that is an interesting passage, isn't it? Why did Moses do what he did? He's, some have said he would be in line to be a pharaoh. I'm not sure if he was or not, but he was Pharaoh's daughter's son, right? If Josephus is correct, he was a, a military leader, military genius. And um, he leaves all that. He comes to the aid of the Hebrews. Why? What is the reason? Hebrews tells us, for the sake of Christ, for the sake of Christ. Now that's an interesting thing to say because uh, Christ is a Greek word and so it's used in Hebrews there to refer to, what does Christ refer to? That's said in the Old Testament, it's the Messiah, right? And so for the sake of the Messiah, Moses did what he did. Did, did Moses understand about Christ? Did he understand about the Messiah? Did he know the promises that Christ would come to redeem? Of course he did. All right, he knew of the coming Savior. He knew the Christ. He knew his history. He knew God's promises. He didn't reject his Egyptian heritage because of pride, but because he chose to follow the Messiah who had not yet come. Isn't that cool? He looked forward to his reward. All right, again, think about that. Moses knew the prophecies. He knew the Savior would come through the Israelites. He's looking ahead. 
towards that. And he saw the true value of following the coming Savior. I mean, think of what could have been Moses' life in Egypt there and already was in such, um, in such a role that he played there. And yet he turns that all down to follow Christ. So again, if you're writing in your, your topic sheet what early man knew, what early man knew before Moses wrote it, Moses hasn't written it yet, Moses knew about Christ. He chose to be mistreated with the Israelites rather than all the pleasures of Egypt. He looked ahead for the rewards of following Christ. Isn't that interesting? Before any of this is written, Moses knew about the Savior. All right. Very interesting. You can add that to your um, text there. I guess I don't have it in your... Uh, class notes, but it's in the Hebrews passage there. Okay. And then in uh, 2.15, we see something else interesting. Um, I think I've got you guys stuck on that. You can take a picture of my handout after class, too, if you want to. All right, in, in 15, we see when Moses uh, uh, killed a man, and when Pharaoh had heard about it, Pharaoh wants to kill him. And this is Pharaoh's daughter's son. He wants to kill him. And where did he go to live? In Midian. Circle that. All right, so Midian. Do you see where Midian is? So he's in Egypt. The ruling body is down here somewhere. Does that, am I, do you see where I'm pointing? Oh, there we go. Okay, and Midian is over here. Do you see that? Wow. That a surprise? Midian's over here. And so he flees probably uh, probably this route over to Midian. We're going to come back to that. How many miles do you think that's? That's a good question. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. You could ask Siri. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Depending on the route you took, not by plane, you know. Okay. So the Sinai Peninsula there, that's between the two areas, between Egypt and Midian, the Sinai Peninsula was a desert area that the Egyptians controlled. So he went past the Sinai Peninsula over to Midian. The scripture tells us that. All right, so hint of a future lesson here. Where do most people place Mount Sinai? In the Sinai Peninsula. Is that what the scripture tells us? Is it Constantine's mom that chose that spot? Okay. I may be wrong on that off the top of my head. We'll cover it in a few weeks. That spot where Mount Sinai is placed is just because somebody said that's where it is. There's never been any proof of it. Okay? But the Bible tells us that he went to Midian. So that's just a teaser for what we're going to be covering in a couple weeks here. Okay. So uh, Midian, and in your class notes, the end of box 10 there, uh, Midian is, uh, the people of Midian is the son of Abram's, second wife. You can put your cross-reference in there. So Moses flees, flees to Midian, and let's see what he does there, 16 through 22. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to the rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Raul, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. Where is he? Raoul asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Uh, Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses and Mary. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Okay, and Gershom means, if you want to write in your margin, it means an alien, it means a refugee. He names his son refugee or alien because he, has, he was in power in Egypt, if you will, and now he's become a refugee. Okay, and in your class notes there, um, you can, uh, box 11, cross-reference Exodus 2, Exodus 3, 1, Moses' father-in-law rule is also called Jethro, okay, in chapter 3-1. Uh, 
Jethro, priest of Midian. Ruel means friend of God. See the L E L at the end of Ruel? Friend of God. Jethro means his excellence. Perhaps a title for his being a priest. So that Jethro's probably his title. Yes. I just looked up the mileage. Oh, okay. <laughs> Welcome actually, back. Google okay. says how long did it take Moses to walk from Egypt to Midian? It said um, 300 miles. Okay. So it said roughly 100 hours walking. Okay. At an average rate of three miles per hour. Okay. Interesting. Could cover three hundred. Very good. And he may have had a horse. The horses came from Egypt later in time. Solomon goes down later uh, to Egypt. But yes, that's interesting. Okay, so around 300, what's that? Or a donkey. Or a donkey or a camel. If he, yeah. if he walked 16 hours a day, that would translate into 6.25 days. Oh, okay. All right. So it wasn't all that long. Yeah. Interesting. They were more used to walking than we are, that's for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, we see the two names here, Ruel and uh, Jethro, are the same man. One's a title, one's his name. And he's a descendant of Abram through Abram's second wife. So that's in your class notes, box 11, if you need to write those in your margins. And again, in 219, they call him an Egyptian because he would be wearing the attire of an Egyptian, probably have his uh, head shaved there. And then in Exodus uh, 2, uh, 23, during that long period, you can underline that if you want to, during that long period, the king of Egypt died, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help became, because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Some purple in there, right? God remembered his covenant. He heard their groaning. He was concerned about them. In your class notes, let me make a correction. Uh, box 12, it says Acts 7.20. That is not correct. It's Acts 7.30. Okay? So you can change that. I've made the correction. 7.30 tells us that that long period lasted 40 years. Okay? So in your margin there where it says... During that long period, you can write in red, Acts 7, 30, 40 years. You wrote it wrong in my margin. Acts right, 7, 30, 40 years. Okay? So, in your class notes box 12 there, Moses went from son of a princess to lowly shepherd in a foreign country. And Egyptians despised shepherds. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so God has compassion on them. And when it says that God remembered his covenant, this is box 13, God remembered his covenant. Remember doesn't mean he forgot. It means he was mindful of it. He, to recount, to recognize, or make mention of it. He brought it to attention now that the time that he had foretold had come. Okay, when, so anywhere in scripture where it says God remembered, it's not because he'd forgotten. It means he brings it to the forefront, if you will. He deals with it at that time, the time that he had planned on. And that takes us to Exodus uh, 3. Let's read 1 through 3. I'll read this. Up in verse 18, we see Ruel. If you want, you can circle that. And then in 3.1, you see Jethro. You can circle that, and I've drawn a line between them. If you want to, it's the same person. Okay, Ruel and Jethro, as I said. So now Moses was attending the, attending the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, who? The angel of the Lord. Highlight that in orange. What did he do? In purple appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. Okay, so Moses led the flocks to Horeb. It tells us the mountain of God. Now, again, this was written in hindsight, right? And so after this event, it's referred to as the mountain of God. All right? It's, uh, known that later. It wasn't at the time. But class notes box 14. Horeb means desolate. And it's called the mountain of God, so we know it as Mount Sinai, right? So Horeb and Mount Sinai are used uh, somewhat 
interchangeably, and your cross-references there are in your class notes. Horeb and Sinai are the same place. Okay. And then box 15, again, we saw the angel of the Lord. This is pre-incarnate Christ. This is Jesus, appears to him. God showed himself in the fire in the bush, uh, later as fire on the mountain and as a pillar of fire in the desert. All right, and then let's see what God says. You can highlight in red in verses 4 and 5 if somebody wants to read that. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So your home study, what do you learn about God from Exodus 3, 4 through 10? These are things you can add to your characteristic of God uh, chart here if you want to. And you can just uh, follow along or mark that later on. See, characteristics of God. It doesn't all fit on the page at once. But lesson 11, 3, 4 through 10, we find out God's holiness. And these are in your class notes on page 64, box 1. We see his holiness, right? Even the ground where God stood became holy. And he tells Moses to take off his shoes. And we see here that um, God calls him by name. Moses had tried 40 years earlier to help God rescue them, right? Moses thought his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. He's a fugitive in a foreign land. He even names his son alien or refugee. He is gone and forgotten, but God calls him by name, all right? He's not forgotten by God. In Exodus 3, 6 there, we saw... Um, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. We see another characteristic of God, his power and his glory, if you will. And then in verse 7, it tells us, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. And so a characteristic of God, we see his love and his compassion. These are all things you could add to your characteristics of God. And again, can you imagine what Moses is feeling? This is just an ordinary day. It was, it was probably a Wednesday or something, right? And he's just out looking for a place to find a pasture for the sheep. And he sees off in the distance this bush burning. And God calls to him by name from the bush. Can you imagine this? And then imagine how Moses feels. Uh, felt when he hears God's compassion for the Israelites, right? He had tried to help, and he couldn't. And can you feel his heart rate going up and just his excitement? Just, just because of the whole event of this bush burning and God talking to him and saying it's holy ground and listening to God and hearing his compassion for the Israelites. Can you hear him just saying, this is so great. I mean, 40 years ago, I tried to do something, but I thought God had forgotten, and here he is. And he hears his compassion. And so in verse... Eight, uh, he says, um, God says, So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites and all the otherites. And so he's going to carry out what he had told Abraham hundreds of years before. And so again, we see God's authority, right? Do you see the name of God, El Olam, here, who carries out his plan throughout the ages? Remember one of the names of God that we learned. Here we see El Alam in action. He's going to carry out his plan. All right, and when it says a land uh, flowing with milk and honey, it's good for herding and grazing. And uh, honey, um, of course, bees, crops for pollination. And honey was considered a rich delicacy provided by a prosperous land. Okay, and then um, box your class notes, box two, there tells you the cross-references to go back to of the uh, Canaanites. 
And remember, God had told uh, Abram back in Genesis 15 that the sin of the Amorites had not yet reached its full measure. Well, now it has. And God's going to bring judgment. Okay, so those are your cross-references. It has now reached its full measure. And you can write that in the margin of Exodus 3 here. God is going to send them into the land of the Canaanites in order to judge them, just as he has prophesied before. So God tells Moses... He's now going to carry out his plan, bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And can you see Moses? He's just, he's about to jump out of his skin here. Can you imagine? I mean, this is really happening. And he's saying, you know, yes, Lord, finally, right? This is great. Thanks for telling me. Until verse 9. And God says in verse 9, And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you. All right? Now, this is a most amazing thing. All right? But Moses hears this, and I can just imagine his excitement, and then he hears that, and he's like, wait, what? <laughs> wait, me? All right, and we're going to see this by what he does here. But the interesting truth we have here, you know, God could have gone in and rescued the Israelites himself, right? I mean, I can... I can't even imagine how many possibilities that God could use to rescue them, but he often uses people to fulfill his purposes. Isn't that interesting? What's that? To increase our faith. To increase our faith? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, and another interesting thing I find very interesting is often his choices of people seem rather unlikely. Right? As you look through Scripture and you see the people he's used... I mean, can't you kind of add your name to it as unlikely people that God could use, right? And so we'll see that Moses did not feel qualified for the job. But another truth we learn about God is when he gives someone a job to do, he gives them the ability to do it, right? And so, again, consider Moses' thoughts. He is excited for this until it becomes very personal. In your home study, it says the remainder of chapters 3 and 4 record Moses' reluctance to do as God instructed him. This is on page uh, 62. Moses, um, there are five reasons Moses gave for not being able to fulfill God's command, and so we're going to look at those. And let's read uh, Exodus 3, 11. Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. Okay. Who am I? Moses felt inadequate. Right? He's not good enough for this job. He felt like he's not qualified for the job. Perhaps he remembered what he did the last time he was in Egypt mm -hmm. and how he had tried to rescue an Israelite. Mm -hmm. You know, and he can say, Lord, look at my past. I mean, you can't use me. Right? Surely God could not use him. He feels personally inadequate. Do you ever feel that way? Mm -hmm. Right. But what is God's response in verse 12? I will be with you. There you go. I will be with you. God did not expect Moses to do this on his own. God himself would be with him. And then God went on to tell Moses something that would happen in the future. What's the rest of verse 12 there? This will be a sign. This will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Okay, on the same mountain, after bringing the Israelites out. So you will not go alone. I am with you. And you will return here to this spot that we're talking at, right here. Okay, you will come and worship God on this mountain. Now, interesting... Um, Again, and with this, you can highlight that portion in yellow because he tells them what's going to happen in the future, right? You will return. And what does this require of Moses? Because God says, I'll give you a sign, and then he tells them something that's going to happen in the future. So, so what do you have to do in order to believe God for that? You have to have that faith, right? You have to trust him in it. All right? So he had to take God's word for it. God's proof is something that hasn't happened. It's ha uh, pointing to the future. 
And so again, we see the character of God here. God knows what will happen in the future. But he cares about Moses, and so he gives him this sign, and God's showing Moses he will survive, he will succeed in bringing the Israelites out, and he will return to this same spot. Okay, so there's the confidence. Moses just needed to respond in faith and obedience. So did Moses come back to the same mountain just as God said he would? Yes, of course. Box 3 tells us that Exodus 19 uh, covers that, and you can uh, write Exodus 19 in the margin there as the fulfillment, and we will cover that when we get to it. In box 4, it says, You will worship me here on this mountain. Exodus 3.12, You will worship is the Hebrew word abad, which means to be a slave, to serve. You will serve me at this mountain. Now, when we see the word worship in Scripture, it, it doesn't always mean what we think it means. Okay, worship has different meanings, and here it means you will serve me at this mountain. You might want to put a note in your margin there. It's the Hebrew word abad, A-B-A-D. It means to be a slave or to serve. So interesting choice of words that God uses because Israel had been slaves. This is in your class notes box four here. Israel had been slaves and served Egypt. Now God would deliver them and they would belong to him and serve him. He would be their Adonai, their Lord and Master. Okay, he would bring them back to this mountain and they would serve him there. Okay, isn't that an interesting choice of words? So it doesn't mean worship as we think, singing praise to God or whatever. It means you will serve me here. Okay, so what, what's Moses' response? He says, let's do this. Let's go, right? Well, no, he has a second concern. Uh, let's read verse 13. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Okay, so if you want to count his concerns, you can put a 1 next to verse 11. Who am I that I should go? And then a 2 next to verse 13. Suppose I go and, and they say, what's his name? What should I tell them? So Moses wants proof for the Israelites. Now, he's unsure about going and God says, I will bring you back here. But he wants proof for the Israelites now. Proof that God is sending him to them. He wants credibility, right? Something that would prove to them that he's worth listening to. He doesn't want any of them saying, hey, aren't you that guy who killed the, right? Why should we listen to you? You know, what are you trying to do here? So, um, who is he to say, God says this? And so, Moses is asking God what his name is. And again, remember, the Egyptians worshipped many gods, okay? What should he tell them that it's the one true God that sent him? Why should they believe him? And so, what is God's response? Verse 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Wow, this is amazing. So highlight in orange, I am who I am. And then later when it says, I am. Okay, so there's just orange and purple in that verse, okay? And some red, I guess. All right, so God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say. Um, and so the Hebrew word, verb, uh, is to be. The one, I am who I am, it's to be. Tell them to be, okay? The one who is always present, the self-existent one, eternal. He's saying, I will be what I am, past, present, and future. I am, just self-existent, okay? So this is what he tells them. I have it on your, uh, up here on the board. All right, so in box five of your class notes here, I am God's personal name, Y-H-W-H, which we often pronounce uh, Yahweh or Jehovah comes from the Hebrew word which means to exist or to be. Jehovah means self-existence, eternal. It means I am, past, present, and future. All right, this is who is sending you. And so you can add that to your Names of God chart if you want to. <coughs> I am. Your Names of God is given chronologically. You can add uh, what we see there. I am, God's personal name from your class notes there. Okay, and then let's, uh, let's see, box um, six, we're gonna look up uh, John, the reference there in a minute, but box six, lesson for life, 
We need to realize that God is not just a God who acted in the past or who will act in the future, but who is with us now. We need to worship, which means slave or serve, obey God who is with us now and forever. He has not, nor will he change. And then our cross-reference there is John 8, 58. Let's read uh, John 8, 58 and 59. That's page 1680. What does Jesus say in John 8, 58 and 59? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abram was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Okay, you can cross-reference that back to the account here in Exodus. Jesus claimed to be the I Am, and they knew exactly what he was saying because they picked up stones to kill him. Okay, before Moses says, I Am. He's saying he's God. He's the one who spoke to Moses. He's the one who spoke to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's saying that he is the eternal self-existent God. Isn't that quite the statement God or Jesus makes? And so they see it as blasphemy, and they pick up stones. Uh, many have argued, oh, that's not what he meant. Well, that's what the Jews standing there knew he meant, because they pick up stones to kill him. Okay. And there's your cross-reference in box 7. Jesus is the I Am. He is the one we see here with uh, Moses. So God then went on to tell Moses exactly what's going to happen when he went to the elders of Israel. Uh, Exodus 3, starting with uh, 15, God said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, that's his covenant name, right? Has sent me to you, present. So the God of Abraham, your ancestor, and Isaac, and Jacob, long ago, has sent me now, present. So we've got in there the past, the God of your fathers. We've got present, has sent me. And then he says, this is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. And there we have the future. God is the past, present, and future. He is the I am. All in what God says right there. He looks into the past and the covenant, the present with Moses into the future generations. In verse 16, Go assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they would recognize that as his covenant name, the covenant, appeared to me and said, I have watched over you, and have, I, I have seen what has been done to you in Egypt, and I have promised to bring you out of your misery of Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezzarites, Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And so again, catch those past, present, and future in there. And he tells them then, he tells Moses what to say and how they would respond. He just lays this all out in verse 18. The elders of Israel will what? They will listen to you. You can circle that if you want. This is going to happen. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. Circle that. And, and if you want highlighted in orange, we're going to come back to this many times. Unless a mighty hand uh, compels him. Um, some of the translations say under compulsion. But that means a strong hand, a mighty hand. So if yours says under compulsion, you might want to write in your margin, a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among that. And after that, he will let you go. So again, God knew all of this. Nothing is a surprise to God. And we're going to see his mighty hand as he stretches it out against the Egyptians. And then in... Uh, 21, and I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards his people so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. And this is exactly what God had told them. Let's just jump back real quick to Genesis 15, 14, and that's your... Uh, cross-reference there, Genesis 15, 
14, God told Abraham this would happen. You can highlight that yellow. What does Genesis 15, 14 tell us? But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and after that, after they will go out with great possessions. Okay, with great possessions. He even told them that would happen. And God is telling Moses this is exactly what's going to happen, just as he had told Abraham. Okay, and your cross-reference there is in box 7. Okay, now the King, King James there where it says plunder, the King James uh, says that they would, um, well, let's see, they would borrow. Okay, ask, I guess uh, back here in 3.22, every woman is to ask of her neighbor, Okay. So it means to ask or to request. That is a good um, translation there. So after 10 devastating plagues, we're going to see next week, uh, the Egyptians are eager to give them anything they ask for. Right? Just take it. Just go. All right? We're going to see that. And again, um, the Israelites have been slaves and have worked free for decades. Right? Now they're going to be paid for their work. They're going to go out with great wealth. What's that? Centuries. Yeah. Years. Yeah. Yeah. So, and not all of that time were they slaves, but we don't know exactly the time they were slaves, but yes, for centuries. So God had it all worked out. Um, do you think that Moses could have any doubts now? I mean, he, he says, what's going to happen, and they're going to listen to you, and this is what you're going to do, and you're going to come out with great wealth, just like I told Abraham, right? So now he's ready to go, right? He'd given him every detail, um, and he says he's promised to be with Moses the whole time and bring him back. And what does Moses say in chapter 4, verse 1? What Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Okay, what if they don't listen to me? Now, did you see uh, up in verse 18 I had you circle what? They will listen to you. And in verse 1, what does he say? What if they won't listen to me? Right? Again, so his third concern what if they won't listen? And Moses wanted a sign for the Israelites. He wants to make sure that they understand this. Okay? And so um, I'm sure Moses knew what God said, but he still wants proof for the Israelite. And God apparently understood uh, what he's asking. And so Moses asked for a sign, basically, and God gives him three signs. All right? Uh, chapter 4, verse uh, 2. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. The Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Now, how long do you think it took Moses to... <laughs> uh, seriously, Lord? So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Now that's pretty good credentials, isn't it? Wow. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand in his cloak, and when he took it out, his skin was leprous, and it became white as snow. Now, put it back in your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back in his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored, like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, If they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they might believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Okay, so in your class notes, box 8, the three signs God gave Moses. The staff became a snake, and snakes are uh, represented, uh, represented power and life to the Egyptian. Their symbol often included snakes. What else is a snake a symbol of? Mm -hmm. Satan, satanic activity, right? Interesting. His hand, number two, became leprous, and it was a, a prevalent disease in Egypt considered to be incurable. And then water from the Nile turned to blood. And the Nile was considered the source of life and the source of eternal life to the Egyptians. Okay, so these three signs would mean something to the Egyptians as well, right? Okay, so pretty good credentials here. Um, I think that would be enough proof to the Israelites, don't you? 
All right, so again, think about Moses' concerns. First he felt inadequate, he's not good enough to do what God calls him to do, and God says he will be with him. All right, and then Moses wanted proof that it was God who had sent him, and God tells him his name, I am, is with you. I am is sending you. And next Moses wants a sign to show the Israelites that they would, uh, so they will listen to him, and God gives him three signs. So now Moses is finally ready to go, right? No. No. What is Moses' fourth concern? Verse 10. He's not eloquent. <laughs> he doesn't speak well. Yeah. He doesn't speak well. He stutters. He stutters, yeah. And he's got to go speak to the Israelites and to Pharaoh. So his inability to speak to people, slow of speech, not a good speaker. And again, who is Moses looking at through all of this? Himself, right? And his inadequacy. Does that sound familiar? I mean, don't we do that? Yeah. And so... Interesting enough, Acts tells us a different story. If you've got your bookmark still there, let's look at Acts 7, 22. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. Mm -hmm. He was powerful in speech. He was eloquent in speech. He was well trained. Okay? And again, as we think of his possibility being a general and leading so many people and so well educated, um, and so, again, you can write in your margin next to Exodus 4.10, Acts 22, eloquent, powerful in speech. He's trained in Egypt. But it has been 40 years, right? And he's been talking to sheep for 40 years, <laughs> right? He can talk to large herds of sheep without any problem, right? But God's given him the right perspective here in his answer. Let's read 11 and 12. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Can All right, tell? through 12. Okay. Now isn't that, don't you love that? Who gave man his mouth? Yeah. Right? So whenever you have an excuse, right, I always think of that. You know, when God wants to, who, who gave man his mouth? Who gave man time? Who gave whatever excuse, fill in the blank? Who gave this to us? So God says, now go. All right? And so um, he says, I will help you speak. I'll tell you what to say. And so there's your box nine, has your cross references. And so God's giving him the right perspective. He gives us what we need to do the work he calls us to do, right? We just need to obey him. Just need to allow him to teach us and, and uh, just have that faith in, in trusting him. And again, Moses' focus is on himself. Who should his focus be on? It's the same thing with us, right? Who should our focus be on? What he has called us to do. And here I think we see God's uh, a first hint of his impatience. Kind of a warning here to Moses. He's commanding Moses to go. And God has promised he'll tell him what to say, right? Just go. So, but uh, Moses is still reluctant, really. You, you, as you read this, you can really see Moses just doesn't want to do this, right? Um, surely someone else could do it better, right? Do you ever feel like that? Yeah. Well, what does he say in verse 13? <laughs> Please send someone else. Do you hear that? Why me, right? Send someone else. Now, you can highlight that in gray. Because God has told him he'll be with him, he'll provide, he'll tell him what to say, and he just doesn't want to do what God calls him to do. That's, that's gray, right? That's bad news. And the Lord knows it. What is his response? Verse 14. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you and his heart will be glad when he sees you. Okay, so the Lord's anger burned against Moses. You can highlight that in purple, right? What did the Lord do? He's angry. And he promises here, though, to send Aaron. So again, let's look at this from God's perspective. Up till now, God has answered all of Moses' concerns, right, um, in a way that left no doubt. And now God's had enough excuses. Let's just get this done right let's just go and so his anger burns against Moses 
And again, think about it. God's provided everything for Moses. He's proven his power and his authority. He's shown his love and mercy. He's been patient to answer all of Moses' concerns. Then he commands Moses to go. And what does Moses do? He begs not to. Right? So again, you can add to your characteristics of God chart if you want that God doesn't like to be told no. Right? When he calls us to something, our response should be, yes, Lord. Right? Moses is going to learn that. When he tells us to do something, there are no excuses for not obeying. Just trust and obey. Just say, yes, Lord. All right. Box 10. Lesson for life. Moses' excuse. Do we give excuses for why we don't want to do what God calls us to do? We see our own inadequacies, right? Our own failures. But what God calls us to do, He prepares and empowers us to do, right? We will never be qualified to do what God calls us to do, right? Just do it, right? Okay. So, although God's angry with Moses, He still honors Moses' request, and He had already sent Aaron. Aaron's already on his way while they're having this discussion. All right? But because of Moses' hesitancy, the Lord rebukes him here. Rather than, can you imagine if the Lord would say, oh, and I've thrown in a little bonus, your brother's on his way. Right? But instead, in anger, he tells him about this. And so God meets the need, and somehow Aaron has escaped uh, from Egypt here. So box 11, think of Moses' life. God protected him from death as a baby. Moses was raised in the Egyptian nobility, well-trained in Egyptian ways. Moses lived in the desert, great preparation for leading Israelites in the desert, right? And now God called Moses to do the job he had prepared him to do, right? He knows how to respond and how to act in Egypt. He knows how to live in the desert. Is there any better candidate, right? God had prepared this and planned this all along. So God's leading and protection and God provided Moses for the Israelites. He protected him. And he provides Moses with everything he needs. And let's read, uh, fifth, did we read 15 through 17? You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you and it will be as if, if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. Okay, so God's not sending him alone. He's going to be right there with them, and he's going to have Aaron with them, and he's going to give them both power and words and wisdom, right? Because they will follow him. And so God's now carrying out his plan, and um, he's going to see it to completion here. And so again, looking back at Moses' life and for those 40 years in Midian, can you see him just looking back and saying, I messed up and what can I do and how is, you know, and that was all part of God's plan, right? Okay, and that takes us to your memory verse. What was your memory verse this week? Yeah, I'm confident of this. Oops. Again, a good work in you. We'll carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He's doing a good work in us as well, and He has called us to do work, so we just need to trust Him, and we need to become grounded in God's Word so that we're ready and equipped to do His will. Just the trust. Okay, let's read Exodus 4, 19 and 20. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt, and he took the staff of God in his hand. Okay, so Moses finally got ready and went, and the staff of God, that's the stick that God had caused to become a snake again. In verse 21, the Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Again, starting off here, and God is still instructing him. And uh, where you see there, I will harden his heart. You can underline that if you want to. We're going to get into that next week. But we'll see that Pharaoh would harden his heart six times before God did. 
okay? Pharaoh already had a hard heart. He was determined to reject God. But God would use even that for his glory. Okay? And then where it says firstborn son, you can underline that if you want to. And again, the firstborn son simply means the place of position and blessing and importance. So the literal firstborn was the eldest son who had the special position in the family with special rights, privileges, and responsibility of inheritance, as we've talked about in the past. But here it's used figuratively to indicate the special place Israel has within the whole family of God, the special privileges the chosen people enjoyed and their special responsibility. And now the word worship here also in verse 23 let my son go so he may worship me. That is the word to serve, to obey. Let my son go so he may serve me, so he may obey me. Okay? 24. So God has given him instruction. Then something happens along the way, at a lodging place on the way. The Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Sipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. Now what in the world is happening? You know, Moses has finally given up his excuses. He can't get out of this. He's following the Lord. He packs everybody up. They take off. And now the Lord's about to kill him. And again, highlight that in purple. The Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. What is going on here? We see his wife is not too happy about this at all, but we're told it has to do with circumcision, and she circumcised their son there. She was a Midianite, and um, it seems they would have known about this but didn't uh, actually follow it um, themselves. But box 12 here, I'll just go through it this way. Um, we need to get God's perspective on this. Moses had not circumcised his son. What was the sign of the covenant? Circumcision. That was their part. Okay? And so, in your uh, box there, God's perspective. I've protected you. I've taught you. I've equipped you. I've met every need. And now you've disobeyed my clear teaching. You've disregarded my word. You've sidestepped my required covenant. It's a breach of contract. Okay? So, Moses sets out. He takes his wife, his sons, his staff. There's only one thing missing. Obedience. Right? Obedience to the commands of God. And so God says, stop. First get things right bef before me. Right? First obey. So the text doesn't give the details, but it sounds, uh, seems that God has caused Moses to be um, incapacitated, so he could not complete the task, so his reluctant wife has to do it. And she says when she puts the foreskin at his feet, it sounds like he's on his back. He's prostrate. He can't do this. He's about to die. So she circumcised the son. And um, so that she is uh, in on the obedience, reluctant obedience as well. In your class notes, box 13, um, again, you can reference back to the requirement of circumcision. So he had not uh, followed the Lord's command. Just clearly, while he was in Midian, he did not circumcise his son. In box 14, lesson for life, you can't serve God without obedience. You can't serve God and take the word of God lightly. You can't serve God and justify sin. Omissions are sin and are just as serious, right? Isn't that what we see from them? He's following the Lord, but he neglected to do what God had called uh, all Israelites to do. Okay, so now think about this. Moses hasn't obeyed God by obeying the required sign of the covenant. What does this say to the Israelites, right? If he's going to lead the people out, if he doesn't obey God, why should we? Right? If he's going to take God's word lightly, so can they. Isn't that the true of us too? If we take God's word lightly, what are we saying to everyone around us? So can they. Right? The importance for a follower of God to follow him. So the excuses we give for sin in our life or disobedience uh, permits others to sin. So Moses starts over by obeying God's command. He now has the proper fear of the Lord. Right? Chapter 4, verse 27. The Lord said to Aaron here, 
go to the wilderness and meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. So they hadn't gotten very far on their journey. It's like they took two steps from the mountain and he, he's about to kill him. Because Aaron comes and meets him there at the mountain and Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say and about all the signs he had commanded him to perform. And so they meet there at the mountain. And can you imagine that reunion, right? I don't know what relationship or how much they saw each other back in Egypt, but 40 years at least has gone by, if not longer, uh, since they have uh, been together. 29 through 31, Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed, just like the Lord said they would, right? So I've circled that. You can cross reference that back to 318, just as God said. When they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. All right, and the word worship there means to prostrate, to reference, uh, reverence, to give homage. All right. So again, the thing we need to realize is that God has called us to do the work he has prepared in advance for us to do, right? That was one of our memory verses. And have you ever thought of it that someone might be praying for someone to come to their aid? And God is preparing you for that very thing. Um, or someone to, to teach them about God and God is answering that prayer by preparing you. All right. So class notes box 16, lesson for life. God does not call the qualified he qualifies the call. And, and many have said this. I'm not sure the original source, but I think that's well said. And you are called, right? All right, so again, take this seriously. People are looking for answers, and God has all of them. Who's going to tell them? Who's going to obey them? You know, what, what's your excuse? All right, God calls us, uh, prepares us for works of service to build the kingdom of God. He calls us to a great work that he prepares us. And so again, that's the importance to learn his word well. And I hope that's what you're doing this year, to rightly divide the word of truth, put it in the right context, what it really means. And one of the uh, uh, great ways to really learn and cement it in, that's my word, of course, is your journals, cementing in things you've learned. But another way, the next step, is sharing what you've learned with others, mm. right? Something about telling someone what you've just learned and showing them really helps cement it in, and it blesses them too, right? And it helps it maybe just the very thing that they need. So get used to sharing what you've learned because that's part of the preparation and doing the work, right? Just learning the simple truth. It's not memorizing a planned program or a set, to, set of things to say or follow. It's just knowing his word and then sharing what you learn, right? Isn't that exciting? That's the most amazing conversations you'll ever have with another human being, is talking about God and his word and what you've learned through it. Okay, so and then in learning it and sharing it, also remember to obey what he says in every area of your life, right? When you come to something and he says and you're convicted of that, pray about that, repent, and ask him to help you grow beyond that because you can't serve him if you don't obey him first. And you won't obey him until you trust him. So again, if you're struggling to obey him, um, is it because you don't trust him? You know, that's where we need to start. Is he who he says he is? Is his word true? You know, can you trust in that? And so, uh, have you surrendered to him? Are you still a slave to sin or a slave to God? Who do you serve? He calls us to serve. That was the word worship. To serve him. So in your box, uh, class notes, box 17, how can I know what God wants me to do? It starts with relationship, right? We need to belong to him his way. And that means repenting. To, uh, repent means to turn and go the other way. Repenting, to be, it also means to be taken captive. Repent, to be taken captive. Who's our master until we come to Christ? Satan is our master. We are a slave to sin. And when we repent and turn to God, we have a new master. We're not just set free and we can go out and do whatever we want. We have a new master to follow, right? So it's our relationship with him. Then God's word, we need to know him through what he's revealed in his word. And um, it's his means of allowing us to know him. 
And again, um, don't you think, uh, don't think you can know God's will without learning God's word, right? That's right? How can you know God's will without knowing his word? What do humans tend to do? Well, God would want me to do X, Y, Z, right? That does not line up with God's word. What's, there's a verse on that. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts, your ways than my ways, right? We do not naturally follow God. So we need to know his word. And then third is prayer, communication with him. We need to be in communication with him. And talk to him. I've asked you to journal what you're learning as a way in directly talking to him. Lord, this is what you've taught me this week. In your prayers, talk directly to him about what he's teaching you as well. And then number four, obedience. You need to determine to obey him, to follow him, to say, yes, Lord, and to have the attitude of, I will not tell you no. I will not tell you no. I tell you, when I came to understand this in my life, it changed my life. Because if there was anyone not adequate, it's me. I was the poster child. You know what I mean? And I, I think you can all feel the same way, perhaps, about yourself. But when I decided I will not tell you no, he took me down a path I didn't want to go. And it was painful. It wasn't easy. But it's to make us so that he can use us. Right? And that's what he desires for everybody. So again, when God shows you something in his word, learn quickly, not painfully. Right? Learn the way you want your children to learn. Right? Um, and learn well enough to share it with others. Become trained and equipped. And your uh, class notes for box 18. What is our class verse here? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us what God's word is for. Those four things. Anybody remember the four things God's word is for? Teaching. Rebuking. Correcting. And training. So what? For what reason? What's all that for? So we for every good work. It's only through the whole of Scripture and His teaching and rebuking and correcting and training us that we can become equipped to do the good work. Right? You see why there's a growth process involved before we can even know what He calls to do us to do. So again, sometimes there's things that stand in the way, um, and we have excuses like Moses did. Now we covered Moses' excuses today. I thought they were kind of good. You know, I think, I think I've used most of them in one way or another, right? They sounded good to me, but God didn't accept them. What are some excuses we could have today as we finish up here tonight? What are some excuses we might have today? Time. Who gave man time, right? Who created time for us? What's that? Yes. And so who should our time belong to? Yeah. When I wake up in the morning, the first thing I pray is, Lord, what's today for doing? <laughs> I mean, I've got my plans. I've got it written on the calendar. I've got all this stuff. That doesn't matter. Right. It only asks for 10% of the <laughs> <laughs> We'll touch on that. In the New Testament, it's more than that. That's all he asks. Oh, okay. All, all right. Okay, so time. What's something else? Just couple, throw a couple me. things out. What's that? I always wonder, is this, Lord, is, are you telling me or is Satan whispering in my ear? Absolutely. So, so you want assurance, like Moses did, but the answers, yeah. And so you want to test that out. I heard something else. Tired. Tired energy. I'll tell you, I don't know if you guys are with me on this, but studying God's word and talking about God's word gives an energy, doesn't it? Does it for you? Is it just me? It just gives an energy. So we'll, I, I think about that, I'm so tired, I just want to stay at home, I just want to, and then you come and you've got all this energy. So what should we be doing? Learning God's word, following him. I haven't heard the main one I usually hear. Fear? Yeah, fear. Yeah. So whatever it is, um, again, we need to put that behind us. Uh, lack of knowledge, ignorance. Uh, well, good, we've got the answer. Learn God's word, right? Um, shyness used to be a huge one for me. I'm the person who always hid behind everyone. I'm short, so I can do that. <laughs> um, but shyness for me, when it, it came to this point in my growth where I realized that in my life, that had to go because God wanted to use me. Does that make sense? And so I realized my shyness was self-focus. All right, so I had to give that over to him. So again, um, 
write down the things that stand in your way. One of the lessons for this week, write down the things that you feel stand in your way and take them to God like Moses did here. And, um, and then learn from his word. When you hear uh, something from his word, memorize the verses that help you with that. When you say time, who gave man time, that's not an actual verse, but who gave man his mouth is what I'm pulling it from. But learn God's word and get his answers on these things because no one wants you to know God's word more than he does, right? Okay. So again, um, I challenge you to do that uh, this week. And I just I have to close with this illustration because I drew it up here and you're all wondering what it is. Um, the key here for serving the Lord is that you know we, we can have a big heart to reach others, right? We can have a big heart for people, but if, if we don't have the knowledge right, of God's word, are we really helping them? So it's got to start with the head knowledge. It's got to start with the truth from God's word, right? The actual word of God trains us and equips us. But if it just stays in head knowledge, I like my little diagram. Did you, can you tell I took an art class? <laughs> um, if it just stays in head knowledge, what does that do? God's word tells us that it's just head knowledge that puffs us up and makes us proud we know the answers, right? So we have to learn God's word in order to serve him. But it has to sink down into our heart, right? It doesn't start in the heart. It's got to be in the head now. It sinks down to the heart. And as it sinks down in the heart, then as we grow and mature, it has to go out in service through our hands and feet, right? As we follow the Lord. And so it's exciting to see God work in our lives when we let him grow us like that, when we take our excuses to him, if you will, and let him uh, rebuke us if he needs to and train us. And it's exciting to see it in Moses' life. What a great work God could called Moses to do. So I want to challenge you uh, in that as well. Any thoughts or questions as we close tonight? Was that good? Was that a, some conviction there? All right. Well, next week we're going to cover the plagues. Fascinating account. So let's go ahead and uh, close in prayer. Father, again, we just thank you so much for your word and that we can depend on it, that it's trustworthy, that it's found, um, proven to be true over and over, regardless of what men uh, unbelievers try to do to um, silence your word, Father. It stands today and it is constantly proven true. We thank you for that. We thank you for the power of your word as we apply it in our own lives. We thank you that you care about us, that you know us by name, and that you call us to follow you, to know your word well, and to serve you, Lord. And we pray that you will just um, speak to us and grow us as we commit to learn your word in this way. And um, Raise us up to do the work that you have called us to do. We thank you for that. And just go with us this week as we continue to dig into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.